Hi, I'm Mr. Simons and in this video we're going to look at a particularly tricky area of where the balance of payments and exchange rates kind of uh, overlap, uh, converge, uh, come together, however you might want to explain it. So what we're looking at is how does the balance of payments balance under a floating exchange rate, that floating exchange rate, such an important part of our discussion in this video. All right, play the intro. All right, so a couple of things before we get uh, really stuck into the nuts and bolts of this, but our essential question that um, you should add to your notes in discussing about this is, how does the balance of payments balance, right? And there are kind of two ways of looking at this. One is that what are the key links between the balance of payments categories, right? What are the key kind of interconnections between the two? And in this, we're sort of looking essentially at looking at those inflows on the capital and financial account, create those outflows on the current account. And that helps to explain that balance. But a second way of looking at this issue, and I'll just put this in red because this is our focus for the video, is this kind of idea that it always starts with under a floating exchange rate. So it's not the same as number one, it's different. It says under a floating exchange rate, explain the relationship between the capital and financial account and the current account. And as I've written here earlier, we're gonna focus on this number two. So I just want to make sure that you can see that the key thing you should be looking for, if this will be relevant, is this idea of, okay, under a floating exchange rate. All right. Let's progress our discussion. So remember we're talking about how, um, we're talking about under a floating exchange rate, what is the relationship between the current account and the capital and financial account? So if we're thinking about how do we demonstrate this, there are a number of steps in demonstrating this, in illustrating this. So the first thing is what determines the supply and demand uh, for Australian dollars? right? What determines this? So what we'll do is we'll separate this out here. On this side, we'll say, so we've got supply of Australian dollars and demand for Australian dollars. So with supply of Australian dollars, something that I've, I've talked about in a previous video, you can click on it now in terms of that, that supply of Australian dollars, is what we're looking at are, we're looking at those outflows from the balance of payments. What I'm thinking about, well, the supply comes from, um, payments for imports, right? That we would need to sell Australian dollars to buy foreign currencies to then buy imports. So the supply of Australian dollars is partly determined by demand for imports, hence M there. The next thing is that uh, supply of Australian dollars, so money leaving Australia, well, that's also relating to income debits, right? Essentially, primary income debits. So that's uh, money that's going to be leaving Australia to cover those income flows that we owe. And the other thing that would determine supply of Australian dollars would be, would be capital inflows from Australia going overseas, right? So from Australia going overseas. And these things will determine the supply of Australian dollars. So when we talk, so we've got imports, what we could talk about is Y debits and capital outflows. So we might just get our, um, let's say our green highlighter here and we'll say, okay, so supply of Australian dollars, imports, income debits and capital outflows. Okay. Now, this is tricky. Um, it can confuse a lot of people. So if you need to pause it, just revise that little bit, you could do that now. Okay, so if we talk about the demand for Australian dollar uh, dollars, that we're talking about inflows into the balance of payments, so money coming into Australia. So if we're looking at uh, demand for Australian dollars, rather than imports, we're looking at exports, right? If people demand exports, they're going to demand Australian dollars. 
the other thing is that people will need Australian dollars to pay to pay income credits, so money coming into Australia for income flows. We also would need Australian dollars, right, for capital inflows if uh, there's big foreign investment coming into Australia. So capital inflows from overseas to Australia. So just as we highlighted on that side, what we'll do is we'll get our blue here. We'll say, okay, we're talking about demand for Australian dollars, uh, level of exports. Uh, let's just make this consistent. So we'll say here, we would say um, Y credits and capital inflows. Okay, so we've got just an idea, a bit more of an idea about uh, how these things work, right? So what we're going to do is we'll scroll down a little bit and it says now, where does equilibrium occur under a floating exchange rate? So if I'm thinking about this, okay, where does equilibrium occur? Oh, okay. That the equilibrium for the Aussie dollar will be where the supply of Australian dollars equals the demand for Australian dollars. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these two things together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, I can use those for the supply and this part for the demand. Let me show you what I mean. So remember that with the supply of Australian dollars, what I'm talking about is everything here that I've highlighted in green. So all I'm saying is that the supply of Australian dollars is determined by demand for imports, income outflows and capital outflows. Now we're going to look back at the demand for Australian dollars. If we scroll back up here, I'm like, oh yeah, demand for Australian dollars, everything that I've highlighted here. So what I can say then is, okay, so now I've got these things here. What I'm just going to do is switch my pen to black as we put this all together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group together capital outflow and capital inflow. And I'm going to put it on this side. So what I'm going to say is that if I'm going to bring outflow on this side, so I've got capital inflow minus capital outflow. So then I've, um, I've taken care of that and I've taken care of that. Now on this side, I know that imports and exports go well together. So what I might do is say imports minus exports. So all I'm doing is I'm bringing exports to that side and linking it with imports. Now I've got here, what I would say is that, okay, Y debits, that links well with Y credits. So I could bring that to that side. So what I've got here is I've got imports minus exports, Y debits minus Y credits, 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 equals capital inflow minus capital outflow. Now what I can do is I've got a couple of things going for me. So if I look at imports minus exports, if imports is larger than exports, okay, I'm going to get a bogs deficit. And then if the income outflows are greater than the income inflows, oh yeah, I'm going to get an NPY deficit. And then if I go over here and I think if capital inflow is greater than capital outflow, okay, I'm going to get a capital and financial account surplus. So if I take all this information into the next step, what I could say is that going from this floating exchange rate point that a current account deficit will be equal to a capital and financial account surplus. And that is the process. That is us explaining how the balance of payments balances under a floating exchange rate. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going to start, okay, step one here. Step two, I'm going to break down each of these categories. Step three, I'm going to rearrange. And then step four, Ah, here I am. And this is showing us 
and that the really crucial part is that under a floating exchange rate. If it says under a floating exchange rate, then I know I need to start from this point. And then I go through steps one, two, three, four, and there I'm showing that a current account deficit equals a capital and financial account surplus under a floating exchange rate. Okay, so this is truly not easy. This is a bit abstract and complicated, but the reason why I've gone through it is that there have been past exam questions that look specifically at this issue, at the links between exchange rates and the balance of payments. Now, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, please leave them in the comments and I'll be able to deal with them and help you understand this tricky area. All right, thanks a lot for watching.